Hello, and welcome to RNR's Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Valerie King, RNR's editor in chief, and I'm joined today by Mike Fulton, president of Verisk Property Estimating Solutions, which is formally known as Exactware. He oversees Verisk's integrated solutions for estimating, managing, and analyzing property claims. Now, he has a background as a general contractor and has been involved in the residential and commercial construction industry since 1979. And he's been involved in the property claims automation industry since 1992. Now, with Verisk Elevate 2022 right around the corner in February, that's specifically the 15th and 16th of February, we invited Mike on for an event preview. And we'll also talk about trends and innovations in insure tech, plus ongoing areas of interest among restoration contractors like pricing within Xactimate. Thanks so much for joining me, Mike. I am glad to be here. The artists formerly known as Xactware. Yes, yes. Thanks for okay. having me. Absolutely. Great to have you here. Now, first question, of course, setting the stage, can you elaborate on the role that Verisk and Xactimate and you play in the world of restoration? Uh, sure. Great, uh, great starting question. I mean, I, I look at us as a tools provider. I mean, I, my, I grew up in the construction industry and, you know, like any tool, I purchase a tool to make myself more efficient, more consistent in doing, in doing the job and always expanding on that tool set. I mean, it, it, at its core, I think that's, that's really who we are as a tools provider. We do it via technology, but the whole goal is to make sure that whether it's a contractor an IA, meaning an independent adjuster or, or a staff adjuster for an insurance carrier, or even someone in management, you know, to be able to do their job more consistently, more effectively, and, and frankly, quickly. Thank you. And uh, to add to that, I could you elaborate more on how you are rooted in the world of contracting um, and it didn't just start with the tool side for you? Yeah, so well... I mean, I am. Uh, I grew up in the construction industry. I still remain licensed today. Our company was founded by a general contractor. Many of those within the organization remain actively involved in the construction industry, especially those folks in the team that research and publish our building cost data. They, they all remain actively involved in the construction industry through different trades and things of that nature. But uh, I just, I grew up loving you know, taking things apart and putting them back together, loved working with my hands, loved the direct feedback of making something and knowing it was going to be there for a long time. Uh, and this, when I decided, to, you know, that my back wouldn't let me actually continue to work doing that day in and day out, you know, moving into the technology space actually allowed me to stay involved in something I loved. So it's, it's been great for me. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's air conditioned in the summer and it's heated in the winter and it's uh, it works out really well. Thanks for sharing that story. All right. Now I'm happy to just dive right into Veris Galivate. Um, like I said, taking place February 15th and 16th in Salt Lake City and virtually for free, which is really cool. Um, can you talk first about the history of the event and its mission and maybe its target audience? You bet. Um, so this is, I believe, our 13th year of Elevate. It started as the Exactware User Conference, but as we have grown and expanded and kind of blended ourselves further within Verisk, we, we changed the name to Verisk Elevate. Obviously, that ties into some of the branding that you've seen when you, when you introduced me as the head of property estimating solutions. But really, the role is it's, it's intended to bring all of the players, all the stakeholders in, in our industry. And that includes the folks that are out there with a tool belt on, those folks that have a clipboard and, and, and are in management, those folks that are actually doing the repairs, those folks that are paying for the repairs and adjusting the repairs, bringing everyone together for a, a real networking event. It's not, uh, we don't do an expo, like, like many different trade shows or conferences don't have anything like that. It's really just people getting together, learning about products, learning about the industry, uh, and, and learning to, to do business with each other. There is so much. This One of the coolest things about it is there's just, there are so many sidebar meetings that happen during that 48 hours that, you know, the, one of the greatest uh, points of com point, uh, comments that we've had back uh, as a point of feedback has just been, I, can, I get more business done in that 48 hour period than I can get in six months otherwise. And so it's grown, I mean, grown significantly. We had a very large event uh, in 2020, just before the world started 
turning the wrong direction. Um, you know, last and then last year in 2021, it was a completely virtual event. This year, we're trying to inch back into some sense of normalcy. So we're having a hybrid event. Um, capacity will be limited. You know, we are limited to about 450 for the hotel in order for them to maintain the safety standards and social distancing and so on. But uh, and we're not there yet from a registration perspective for on-site attendees, virtual attendees. We've got we've got close to 1,500, I think, at last count that uh, that have registered for it. But really, a great event. Hopefully, you'll be able to make it one of these days. Absolutely, that's the plan. I'm, if nothing else, Good. attending virtually, which I thought was very very awesome and made it super accessible. So that was cool. Um, so. Looking at this year, what can we expect from an educational standpoint? Any highlights you can share with us in terms of sessions, speakers, and that theme? Well, speakers, we, we, we try and have a host of people throughout the industry. Obviously, a lot of speakers that are from the Verisk organization presenting things about the, the tools that we provide and how they fit into your world. And they're very interactive sessions, so they'll be interactive with the folks that are there virtually. Uh, and some of them for, um, interactive with the folks that are there live and for the folks that are there virtually, they'll be available to chat in, I believe, and, and actually get questions answered. So that that's very helpful for folks. I don't think we have anything this year that really provides CE credits for people. We've done that in the past with, with flood certification and so on, but don't have that. We actually post post-conference. So the 17th and 18th, we'll have massive training sessions there for our products for the people that have come into town or those that want to attend virtually so that they can attend those. There's all types of things. There's a, a section where people can just ask the expert. They'll be able to meet with people from our pricing team to talk to them about specifically about the building costs, what we're doing there, talk to our technical support team to get answers about how they can better leverage the product. They can talk to our consulting team to make sure that they're using the products in the best way possible. So I would say that's probably the biggest biggest form of education is just industry education, product education, how can we help them? And uh, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like it really runs the gamut from the, the themes and the innovations and the broader view of the industries and how things happening today impact the stakeholders. And then that really in-depth technical lens in terms of like the technology and solutions right. in particular that you offer. Yeah, one awesome. of the cool things is we put together what's called an experience lab. And as someone as someone from Verisk or whomever, sponsors can actually present there as well. But as they present at a breakout session, a specific set of tools and so on, what they will do is move those presenters will move right from there into the experience lab so that customers and attendees can go in and talk to them one on one, get questions about how they might be able to operationalize that within their specific company. Okay, so uh, the important question, where can listeners go to learn more about Verisk Elevate and register? Awesome, go to exactware.com, X-A-C-T-W-A-R-E.com, and there is a big banner that talks about Elevate, and you can register, you can book a hotel room, register either virtually, which is no charge, or, or for the on-site if you, if you care to travel out. It's two and a half weeks away. It's gonna be exciting. It's, it's always, we have mixed feedback about this. It's always the week of Valentine's. So it's not uncommon for people to bring their significant others with them to Salt Lake City and spend the weekend skiing. Nice. Afterwards. Nice. Okay. So obviously this event looks a lot at the future and what's to come and cool new innovations in technology you offer, but also industry themes. So I want to talk more about that. Um, I guess what notable advancements to your software um, should restoration contractors know about whether they're recent or soon to come? Wow. So quite the list. I think some of the ones that are the most exciting is, you know, the, the handheld devices, and I'm not specifically talking about phones, but actually tablets and so on. The technology that has become available in those recently has really enabled us to grow a feature set that enables you to estimate much more quickly. Within our estimating tool, one of the key interfaces for estimating is to diagram the room or diagram the floor plan of the entire home if you're, if you're doing that and, and actually look at exterior elevations. And then from that, you drag and drop 
repair items, whether it's carpet, baseboard, drywall, paint, things of that nature. And historically, it's always been, you know, the user goes out to someone's home, they set their laptop on the counter, they're stretching out a tape measure, and they're actually doing a drawing in like a CAD type of environment. But the technology in these things today that allow you to do that using the camera is just is so accurate and so easy. That has shortened the time to do an entire floor plan, well, probably tenfold. I mean, just just cut it um, in a to a tenth of what it was in the past. That's extremely cool. Object recognition using the same type of technology to be able to look at a room and have it automatically know that's a lamp, that's a desk, that's a chair, that's a wall hanging and, and, and a couch and a TV and so on so that you can do a personal property inventory. Great from the carrier side, uh, if, if they're trying to come up with replacement values from the restorer side, you know, if they're going to do a pack out and cleaning and, and inventorying and so on, they can automatically tag those things, but it cuts that time in half. So I, again, the technology in these devices is critical. And then us applying the analytic to them so that going beyond personal property, going to structural property in the home, when you're scanning that with your video, and you can see that that's drywall, you can see that that's five and a quarter inch baseboard, things of that nature. But by applying other analytics, such as the age of the home, the location of the home, kind of the, an affluence factor of the local area, I can make a determination that if I see that five and a quarter inch painted baseboard, I can pretty confidently guess if the home is less than 10 years old, that it's it's MDF, it's medium density fiberboard. It's not finger jointed pine, things of that nature. It can look at a, a wall that has stone veneer on it and make a, a pretty high degree of confidence guess in whether that it's a manufactured stone or a natural stone. So the things from an automation perspective, just to help whoever is estimating get their job done much more quickly, much more efficiently is, is key. Um, the other thing I think that is big uh, for us, uh, where we've come out with a new feature uh, within Xactimate that's called Exact Scope, uh, And that ties into that graphical estimating using the diagram, but it's specifically targeted towards water mitigation. And that allows, you know, with that being one of the major types of loss that people have to deal with and making sure that that meets the IICRC's S500 standards, you know, you can actually drag and drop air movers and dehues and, and put on vapor barriers within it. And it will measure that and allow you to come back in and do your daily readings and tell you which ones you should remove, add, and so on. That's critical for us. So a number of things that I think help the just the restorer move along much more quickly uh, in the estimating process. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, meaningful stuff and no shortage of it, like you said. All right, more new stuff. Um, well, in a recent interview I had with the Restoration Industry Association, they mentioned Verisk Property Estimating Solutions just conducted the first beta course for a pricing specialist program. Can you tell me more about that? What's that program about? Yeah, great question. And you know, hats off to the RIA organization and their leadership because we, you know, we really wanted to determine so when it comes to providing building cost data. Exact one of Exactware's role is to provide cost data to assist you in the estimating process. And you know, accuracy of that building cost data is is usually pretty specific to the location. It's specific to the the home that's being repaired. It's also specific to the person that's actually doing the repair. And for us to try and do that appropriately in each market, what we do today is we, we actually survey each market. We survey material suppliers, equipment providers, labor providers in each of those markets. And we have thousands of items in hundreds of markets in which we're publishing on a monthly frequency. And so that's a, it's a tremendous amount of work. And we've always said we, we really need eyes and ears to help us in the field. We need contractors, specifically restorers, who, who have a great understanding of local prices to stay in direct contact with us uh, and let us know when something perhaps needs to be adjusted or that there's some sort of new type of building material or some type of new to tool that we can, we can offer up in the price list. What this program does is allows certain individuals to become certified so that we have a we're really on a first name basis, we have a direct contact between that person in each market and a person within our team of folks so that they can pick up the phone, they can talk to each other, they're on a first name basis, uh, and they can feed us information on a, on a much greater level of frequency and a much higher quality than what we would be able to get otherwise. So the whole intent is to involve, to take our team of, of pricing specialists that we have in our office, which is 
which is massively large, and expand it exponentially to a nationwide team. So really excited about that. The first one was a little bit of a while in coming. COVID, COVID slowed that process down, but this was a beta. We're gonna, we'll be certifying those folks uh, that went through that first class, hoping that we can actually have those on at least a quarterly basis so that we can, we can expand it. And it's not a, I mean, we have, it's not going to be anybody can play. It's really, I mean, there's a code of ethics that people have to sign up to when they get into it, because we really want them to understand our process so that we can speak the same language. And we want to have people that we can trust. We want to have people that we can communicate with. They can communicate with us. And we can have a really good bi-directional relationship so that we can be more effective and, and more timely in publishing information out there. Thank you for that. All right. So we took a little look at what's happening and will be impacting the future, getting a little less tangible, but still looking at 2022. I'm curious what key trends you anticipate this year related to that intersection of restoration contractors and the claims industry that you sit at. You know, one of the things we've been focusing, focused on, and I know, I know everybody else in the, in the property uh, repair market has been focused on is just inflationary trends. And we, we really just don't know what to expect. I was quite worried last year, not just with, you know, the inflation of materials, but, <clears throat> you know, should have, should there have been a major storm situation and not to say that we didn't, but we didn't have the same level of major hurricane activity that we had uh, in 2020. Uh, but I was really worried about labor shortages and what that might mean to inflationary trends and the ability for people to, uh, to complete repairs. I mean, we're dealing with material supply shortages that extend the life of a claim now. I mean, any of you guys that have ordered steel and know how long it takes to get that, windows, things of that nature. I mean, thankfully, we're starting to see lumber come back to some level of normalcy, but uh, it's it's just really been a bizarre year to the point when with us publishing data on a monthly basis, we're actually forecasting pricing, something that we haven't had to do in the past because it's so rapidly changing, actually forecasting. So if we publish on February 1st coming up next week, it's not just the price that's good on February 1st, but you have to make sure that that price is good throughout the month of February. And you have to really look at what prices have occurred or what trends have occurred with regard to inflation in the prior couple of months so that you can give some kind of a traje trajectory to it. So that is the biggest concern I think the industry has is getting around you know, price pressure, making sure that we are, we're focused on that. Uh, from a technology perspective, the exact scope tool set that I, I mentioned earlier, we really anticipate rounding that out uh, so that it's, it's a world-class water mitigation and audit tool software uh, by hopefully mid-year. Uh, and, uh, you know, expanding our API strategy so that we can more effectively integrate. We've got a really open ecosystem uh, that we offer up to folks. We're trying to become a platform uh, into which anybody can play, uh, even competitors. Uh, and today, all of our integrations are fairly one-off type of integrations, but putting, in, putting together a very robust API strategy so that we can make those decisions and turn those integrations on much more quickly and have them apply consistently across players in the industry is, is going to be a big key for us this year. Thanks for that picture. Okay, keeping with the foresight theme, looking even further into the future, any broader predictions you might have in terms of the future of estimating and, and what it could look like beyond 2022? Yeah, everybody, and, and probably not so much on the contractor side, I think, although I think the, the restorers will be able to leverage this, but on the insurer side, they're looking for automation. They, look, they want to automate a claim cradle to grave. So FNOL, first notice of loss, that's the intake, the ingestion of a claim from a policyholder, all the way to payment on the back end. And there's, there's multiple links in that chain, if you can imagine, you know, they have to do, does, you know, does Mike, if, if Mike, calls up and says he has a claim or he inputs it into ABC Insurance's application, their mobile application. Does Mike have coverage for this particular claim? Is there any propensity of fraud? We can do that by looking at image forensics and things of that nature, prior claims history. You've got the valuation from which you know, Mike can actually measure out the room and he can see the object that it's carpet that has stain, a stain on it that has to be replaced. There's a number of things that we can do to automate that cradle to grave. And that's really what we're what we're trying to do as an organization. Those little pieces of automation 
I think will be able to be leveraged greatly by, uh, by the restoration community to assist them moving forward. I think the shift that we'll see, this is, this is out there, and I've been talking about this for a couple of years. We went with the advent of the internet. So this goes back to the mid nineties. You know, there, we moved into this world of direct repair or program work as it's called today. So that, you know, if, if, if uh, Valerie has a loss, you know, you call up your insurance company, they send Mike Fulton construction out. They're going to guarantee my work. I'm going to do the estimating and so on. So they, they've actually got a, a program contractor that would come in along with the lines of those automation, uh, the automation that we talked about, what may happen going forward. And this could be several years out is, you know, Valerie would do all of that stuff via her mobile device. They would come up with a settlement amount EFT those funds into your account, and then you find a contractor. And if that contractor, you know, that you're back to the old days of the contractor looking at the estimate that was written by the adjuster, although in the new world, it's a robo adjuster, right? It's, it's done through some sort of an AI machine. And then that contractor works within that system so that they can adjust that estimate as needed, whether the prices have changed, whether there's underlying damage, things of that nature. So I can almost see us cycling back to a process we were pre-internet, which was the, the old traditional method of, you know, go get three bids from contractors, compare them to the adjuster's bid, and we'll go from there. But using automation and analytic to speed that along much more quickly, I think is, is likely what could happen. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that far out prediction, which um, it's amazing how fast technology is moving. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens and how fast. Uh, all right, so now I would like to talk about some of the ongoing topics of interest within the restoration industry. Of course, pricing, it's always a top of mind area. Could you break down in layman's terms, how does pricing work within Xactimate? What goes into the prices you publish? Yeah, great. It is the question that is that we are <laughs> asked the most uh, in this market. And, and education is key. You know, in, in what we do, we we look at ourselves again as a tool, a tools provider. And that means the data that we offer as well is really intended to be a tool to help people settle a loss. And when it comes from the restorer's side, from the contractor's side, they're interested in, sure, in ensuring that the prices that, that they use within an estimate are appropriate for their, their organization. Everybody's margins needs are different based upon their overhead that they have within their organization. A small guy working out of his out of his pickup truck and in, in his garage has got different levels of overhead than the big greens or the big blue franchises, big green and big, big yellow franchises that are out there. But we want to make sure that we're publishing a price that's appropriate. You know, we try and call it a prevailing rate, which means it's kind of the middle of the road. So if the price for a sheet of, you know, seven sixteenths OSB ranges from what used to be pre-pandemic, you know, to, you know, 10 bucks to 15 bucks, we're going to try and hit that midpoint beyond there. So it gives people the confidence and knowing that they can get it for less than that if they need to, they can certainly pay more than that if they have to as well. Uh, the same with labor rates and so on. So we're trying to publish that prevailing rate, but the idea is to do it in such a flexible way that from our perspective, the restorer should be able to modify that. They should have full, full ability to modify those when needed to meet the needs of their, of their organization or meet the needs of the specific job that they have. Jobs are different. You know that accessibility, location, uh, complexity of jobs vary things greatly. Insurers are interested in consistency in pricing because when they don't have consistency, they feel like they've probably got some legal ex exposure Contractors are interested in accuracy for their particular organization uh, and for the particular job that they have, which means that even though I've got two homes, you know, built in the same year that are fairly similar with a similar type of roof destroyed in the, in the same storm, doesn't necessarily mean that the cost to replace that roof should be the same between those two homes. And certainly not if you've got two different contractors using it. We're trying to find the, the midpoint between those two things, consistency, uh, and accuracy. It's a tremendous amount of work. Um, 470 roughly markets in, in which we're publishing 14, I believe, thousand line items uh, in, in each one of those on a monthly basis, more frequently post storm. Uh, we do do direct market research. So we're not using any kind of area factors or anything like that. 
but uh, we're publishing that information and then more recently trying to project a little bit of an inflation or perishability factor into it that take us through the next month. But it's, it's flexibility, it's openness, uh, and trying to provide a really robust engine from which people can estimate. Thank you. Speaking of complexity and flexibility and all of these inputs, I'm curious, um, I understand that to assist with pricing research in their markets, restorers have an opportunity to provide feedback. What does that mean and like, how do they do it? Are there best practices you can offer if restorers want to up their game there? Yeah, sure. The, the, the feedback quote unquote term goes back so long to so long ago. When I started at Exactor in 1992, you know, it was, it was pre-internet, uh, you know, people weren't even using modems to communicate at, at that point. And what we used to do with the application is, you know, we'd, we'd send out a, a a price list. So if, if I'm Mike Fulton and I was in Atlanta, Georgia, I'd pull in an Atlanta price list for that quarter. We were publishing quarterly back then. And as I would estimate, whether it's with drywall, paint, baseboard, roofing, things of that nature, I could adjust to those prices to meet the needs of the job, to meet the needs of my organization. And what we used to do is actually send out, if you remember the old three and a half inch floppy disks, and we would send those out, thousands of them every quarter, the contractor could plug them into their machine, punch a button, and it would capture summary information from the estimates they'd written, and they would return that to us, put it in a stamped envelope, return it to us, and we'd analyze it so that we, we would see what had Mike changed prices on in Atlanta for his jobs? What had Valerie done to change prices for estimates on her jobs in Michigan? And that helped provide us with a lot of market research. Today, that's all done with program work through our exact, our exact analysis system so that when an estimate is marked complete, it comes back up to our system, but we still call it feedback. And that's electronic. The, the key though is what we want and what we want to do is encourage contractors who are not doing program work. And some of them, some of them are doing part of their jobs as program work, part of them as, as not program work. Some of them are not doing uh, program work at all. But we have to have a way to capture that information so that they can have some input on the pricing process. And so what we want them to do is, is either pick up the phone, give us a call, and they can provide feedback to us that way that just says, hey, Mike, did you realize that the price of drywall in this particular market is X? And you can call these subs and verify that for me, help me out, that type of thing. They can send us an email at pricing at exactware.com. They can actually still punch a button within the Xactimate system to collect feedback from that system and send it to us, upload it to us for all of those non-program jobs. But it's a way to, it, it's just a way to get more input from the field uh, into our market research. And it ties right in with that pricing certification class that we talked about earlier. So those folks will be providing certified feedback to us on a regular basis. Thank you for that. that makes sense. It does. So if I'm providing feedback and I'm feedback feedback and I'm giving you a call or I'm sending an email um, and I'm not a part of that formal program that's in the works, are there any best practices for that or is it truly dependent on what I need, what my concerns or feedback is? Um, will yeah, like how technical and detailed should I be with that initial outreach? Is there room for you know you all to say, okay, we need a little more here, me to come back and give you more? Sure. Sure. It's and amazingly, you know, we, we still get emails from people that just says that just say, hey, you guys need to check the price of drywall in, in my area. And, and all we have is an email address. So I don't know where that person is or anything like that. And it, as you can imagine, that takes time for us to drill down and say, OK, who is that email address belong to? What city are they in? And so on. And then we have to pick up the phone and give them a call where we respond to that email to gather additional information. So the more information you can provide in that initial email or phone call, the better. And then again, just from an efficiency perspective. So if I were calling in to the system, I'd call in and say, hey, this is Mike Fulton Construction. I'm in Mapleton, Utah. I've noticed that the price of drywall, for example, or baseboard or air movers, whatever, is not appropriate in this market. I Please check it. Here are some subs, and I'll list out some subs and phone numbers so that you exact where can call them and verify what I'm telling you. That gives us some actionable information that we can just take and run with. And in the end, both of them work, but that latter option shortens the time frame 
you know, to, to days as opposed to potentially weeks. Okay. Helpful to know. All right. Yeah. You already talked about this inflation. It is of course a key issue lately, um, as is the labor, the labor market. So how does Xactimate account for those kinds of developments, changing materials, costs, labor rates, that sort of stuff? Uh, it's a lot of it, frankly, is just good old fashioned picking up the phone and, and, and talking to suppliers. Uh, we have many suppliers with whom we have direct links and relationships with so that they're feeding us data on, a, uh, uh, on an electronic basis and on a regular basis. And that covers the material side of it. And materials inflation is what's been large. Labor is what's tougher. We have to reach out to restorers to get that information. They have to understand what their impact is of labor and, and they have to know what their market is, which they all do. But look at the price of gasoline going up. I mean, that is an overhead cost. And how do you build that into your labor rate and the billable labor rate that you charge? So we, we want to capture that information from those folks. But when you do that, you're capturing info at a, at a snapshot in time. So right now it's, it's January 28th, right? And, and we're about to publish on February 1st. If I'm capturing information from Valerie today on your labor rate for a cleaning technician, I've got a gauge from you also. What's, what's been the trajectory of that over the last month or so? And do we expect it to go up even further through the month of February? So should we take whatever price you're giving us today and assume it may go up even more and cover that amount of inflation? The other piece that's, that's really tough, and, and this ties into some of the challenge from a pricing perspective, is carriers, and this is just part of the policy contract, they, they owe the, the cost to affect the repair based upon the date of loss. So I have a loss that happens on January 28th, I get the estimate in and so on, it's, it's, it's that date. But frankly, I may not be doing the repair until May, right? And specifically, if there's been a major cat and, and there's hundreds or thousands of homes that have been destroyed and you know a shortage of labor, things of that nature, but prices can inflate rapidly in our market. So be, the point of time between the date of loss and actual repair could have a significant impact and be quite significant from a pricing perspective. We're trying to make that shift happen within the market so that people understand that and they can actually pull down and, and update that estimate with a current price list. So if it's actually May, let's update it with a current price list because the settlement that you got back in on January 28th is not going to be effective when you have to replace your roof in, in May. So those are the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, from an inflationary perspective, making sure that we're gauging and putting a perishability factor within those prices that we publish, and also educating the industry that you really have to be using a current pricing uh, price list based upon the time of repair, not so much the time, the, the date of the loss that occurred on the home, because that's where it comes. And anybody that's out there that's gotten a bid from whether it's a remodeler or a a new construction contractor. It's it's not like it was a couple of years ago where they'll give you a bid and say, this is good for six months. It doesn't happen. It might be good for 30 days, uh, but things are changing pretty rapidly. Thanks for that. Okay, so external forces, labor market and inflation covered. Another external force um, following CoreLogic's acquisition of Next Gear Solutions in September of last year, 2021. There's been a lot of talk about the, the ecosystem for restoration software being more competitive than ever. Would you say that's the case? Do you view this as an increasingly competitive landscape? Um, and I'm just curious what you think this all means for Xactimate and your restoration contractor customers. Yeah, I, I think it is, it is increasingly competitive. And, and frankly, that can be a, a very good thing. It, it, it spurs the change that is needed and makes you move more quickly. If, if anything that we've seen from the pandemic, I mean, people were talking about automation pre-pandemic, but you know, the whole work from home and the fact that everybody's a germaphobe and don't want people in their homes and things of that nature has just accelerated the need to put in place these types of, of automated tools. So I view it as, as a good thing. Uh, you know, we've got relationships with the folks uh, at Next Gear uh, and uh, certainly are working to continue the relationship that we have there. And just we're, we're both progressing, you know, both progressing to, to serve our customers, serve the industry. Uh, and I, will things ever standardize? I, I don't know. But, you know, our, our goal is, you know, so if you look at even a tools provider, you know, between Milwaukee and Makita and and very, very similar types of tools they offer, but some some unique differences in them that, that set them apart. And it can be a personal preference thing, but 
it's a good thing for us. I appreciate that. All right. And then another topic of ongoing interest is in this world of increasingly advanced technology and options there, a lot of data gets shared and a lot of gets data a lot of data gets shared and stored within platforms like yours. So how do you respond to the contractors who are concerned about how that information they're sharing within Xactimate is used and safeguarded? Yeah, so data security is of utmost importance to us. And it, it, we're in an interesting world. I mean, when you look at what we're sharing for claim information, for contractors' job information, PII is what it's called. So personally identifiable information. Everybody is, is ultra sensitive about their information being shared. So name, address, phone number, people consider that PII that shouldn't be shared. It's it's weird that it's it's the same type of information that used to be in the in the phone book, you know, years ago, back when those things are available. But you know, everybody is holding that information close to the vest. But uh, data security is is of utmost importance to us, and that's probably when we when we start looking to third parties to integrate with us, or those that want to integrate with us, those that we want to invite to integrate with us. That's probably the biggest. I don't want to say challenge, but it's something that we have to do due diligence on because there's a lot of startup organizations out there. And if I'm going to be sending you data on Valerie King so that you can leverage your software and integrate with us, you have to have really have the same level of data security that we do. And cyber attack is big. Uh, and so that's really the, the a big push for us. And I think that's where, I think that's the root of the question is making sure that we're, we're being protective of that data. But it's a there's a multi ownership type of model in our world. So the, the, the insurance carrier that sends a claim through our system has an ownership in the file. The, the contractor, Mike Fulton Construction, that's writing the estimate and doing the work has an ownership in the file. Valerie King, who's the policyholder who's, whose home is being worked on has an ownership in the file. And we've got to protect that for everybody uh, and, and give appropriate access to everybody. Thank you. Well, that's all I have. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I haven't asked about? Wow. Um, I'm just excited, uh, always excited to do these. So really appreciate the, uh, the invite, uh, Valerie. Happy to do them again. I've got several of them coming up. We usually do one directly after the, after the keynote at Elevate. I would just invite people to, to join us at Elevate. If you can come to Salt Lake, awesome. If you can't join virtually, you're going to get a lot of out, out of it. The folks, because we've got a much smaller crowd in Salt Lake this year than we've had in the past for a live event, they are going to get a lot of FaceTime with a lot of Verisk staff. So it's it's going to be a really cool event. We don't know. I mean, we're still in a very fluid environment with this pandemic. Uh, we'll be taking every safety precaution. There's always the chance that some speaker might not be able to make it because of just things can happen. But you know, we'll we'll pivot. I think the conference will go on, and you know, if if we need to, and cancel a specific session and have a roundtable discussion to just talk about the future of claims, we'll do that. But I think it's going to be really, it's going to be a fun time. It always is, but this one I think is going to be really unique, uh, and we're going to get a much more personal type of experience for those folks that show up. Yes. Okay. So before we go, I always like to ask. For those who want to learn more about you all at Veris Property Estimating Solutions, where do they go? Well, you can still go to exactware.com in, in the short term. That'll be moving over to the verisk.com uh, website shortly, and then it will be a page that you'll access within, uh, within the verisk.com. But like I said earlier on, before we, we started recording, exactware.com can't go away. So there's going to, I mean, it's a brand that's been out there. If people want to search and Google Exactware or Exactimate, they'll, they'll, we will point them to the right site. Product names won't change. So even though the, the, the outward facing name of the organization is shifting from Exactware to Property Estimating Solutions, various Property Estimating Solutions, you'll still have the tried true product names of Exactimate, Exact Contents, Exact Analysis, Claim Experience, uh, and so on. But it's really an effort to change how we outwardly face our organization as, as one Verisk rather than more of a, a branded house than a house of brands, if that makes sense. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm glad you put that, put those pieces together for us because it wasn't one of my questions. Um, so this has been great again. Thank you, Mike. Anytime.
Thanks so much, Valerie. Yes, thanks. All right, listeners and viewers, for more insights on restoration, remediation, and the people behind it all, visit our website, randrmagonline.com, Apple, or Spotify. And if you haven't yet, please be sure to follow the podcast to keep up with all of our latest episodes. And also, if you could give us a quick review and rating, we would so appreciate it. We're also on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as well as Facebook. So we invite you to follow us there too. This has been r and Ask the Expert. Thank you for listening.